Right. A series <coughs> is when you take a sequence and you attempt to reason about what it means to sum them all up. Does it always make sense to, to sum infinitely many numbers? No, it doesn't always make sense to do such a thing. <coughs> Sometimes it does. For example, the sum of zero infinitely many times is zero. Okay, but the sum of pi infinitely many times is not a number. It diverges to infinity. Okay, so sometimes it makes sense to talk about <coughs> uh, the infinite summation of numbers, that is to say, a series. Sometimes it does not. Okay, so one particular series, type of series, category of series that we were dealing with last time is geometric series. So just to remind you, oh, wait a minute. Let's restart the application. <coughs> this card. Because I found that if I start it again, then the writing is smoother. Oh, look at how smooth that is now. Isn't that good? Okay. <coughs> okay, so then, a particular type of sequence. Right? A sequence. AN is said to be geometric if AN plus 1 over AN is R for all N. Okay, <coughs> that is to say the ratio of successive terms is constant. Okay, another remark that I also made last time is that, and this is a consequence which I'll probably have you show on the take-home quiz, every, every geometric sequence can be written as a n is a multiplied by r to the n for constants A and R. <coughs> okay. So then we have this special type of sequence that we're singling out. Okay, and we're saying that every geometric sequence is amenable to this representation, A multiplied by R to the N. Okay, so then for this specific kind of sequence, a geometric sequence, we can consider a series. Okay, so then remark, a geometric series, well, let's not say it, let's say it like this, every geometric series can be written as the sum from n is something to infinity of a multiplied by r to the n. So, where do, by convention, do geometric series start the index? At zero. At zero. <coughs> okay. So then there are sort of two cases, right? The book says that if R is zero, then it's, then it's, that's not a geometric sequence and this is not a geometric series. In any case, the case where R is zero is trivial because what is the sum if R is zero? It's zero. So then, what this means, what this is understood to mean, is this is a plus ar plus ar squared plus ar cubed plus etc., assuming that we're in the case that r isn't zero. Every, every geometric series can be written as such. Okay, further... This converges exactly when the absolute value of R, <coughs> we'll say it like this, 0 less than absolute value of R is less than 1. So, you know, so it's e very easy to tell whether or not a geometric series converges. Okay, but the most fantastic thing is that we're actually able to say exactly what it converges to. So in this case,
it converges to the following. The sum from n is 0 to infinity of a r to the n is, who remembers? Not 2. There, I gave you a particular example where it was 2. <laughs> so what is it? Yes, a over 1 minus r. Fantastic. Okay, so does everybody remember this situation we found ourselves in? <coughs> Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate that this, that all of this stuff is correct, especially this formula. Okay, so is everybody ready for that? So in order to demonstrate that this is a fact, and so basically the one of the significant things we will be doing for the rest of the semester is we just looked at a series. We said if a series can be written like this, it's a geometric series. We're going to go through a long list and say, well, if it can be written like that, it's a blah series. If it can be written like that, it's a foo series of blah 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 we'll just keep going all the way down the line and then we'll be able to say under these conditions this type of series converges and under those conditions that type of series converges blah 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 okay so that's a lot of what we're going to be doing so that brings up the question what does it mean for a series to converge So what does it mean? Like I'm trying to ask you like the mechanical, the underlying mechanical thing, right? The way we said, ah, this is what we mean by a series converging. The limit of what exists? The limit of the series. Okay, but okay. <coughs> so let's make let's make it clear. So remember that the sum for any sequence Right, for any series, the sum from n is anywhere to infinity of a n is by definition equal to the limit as n, uh, no, the limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from n is 0 to infinity of a, uh, excuse me, 0 to k of a n. Okay, so outside, on the left side of that equation, that's an infinite sum. Infinite sums might exist, they might not. Inside of the parentheses, that's a finite sum. Right? I'm summing up the first k numbers. Really, it's the first k plus 1 because we're starting at 0. Right? But a finite number nonetheless. We're summing up a finite count of numbers. Does the thing inside of the round parentheses always exist? Yeah, you can always you can always make that sum inside of the round parentheses. Then the question is is what happens when you compute the limit? Okay, so this this thing right here it was denoted SK and what was it called in English? We called this the the started with the phrase started with K <laughs> No one remembers. K partial sum. Right, which is to say, this is what happens when you add up the first k terms of the, of the sequence. Okay, so then this is equal to, right, using that notation, the limit as k goes to infinity of sk. So to say the series exists is exactly equivalent. They are the same thing as saying that the limit of the sequence of partial sums exists. Okay, so what we must do is we must, for the geometric series, write down the formula for the kth partial sum. Okay. <coughs> so let's do it. So for a geometric series, the sum from n is 0 to infinity of a r to the n with r not 0, right? I'm not interested in the case where r is 0 because if r is 0 then <coughs> it's trivial. I'm also not interested in the case when a is 0 because that one's trivial. So we're in the case where it's in a sense a legitimate and non-degenerate geometric series. <coughs> SK <coughs> SK is a plus ar plus AR squared, 
r squared plus dot 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 plus where am I supposed to stop? A r to the to the k. So I'm going to say a r to the k minus one plus a r to the k. All right. So the kth partial sum <coughs> is the sum of the first k elements. Okay, so is everyone all right with this? <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to <coughs> I'm going to use a nice little trick, right? That I didn't come up with. Some clever mathematician before me, long ago, came up with this. So r multiplied by s to the k. <coughs> r multiplied by s to the k. So now let's carry this out and see what <coughs> it is. So if you do this, it is a r plus a r squared plus a r cubed plus plus a r to the k plus a r to the k plus one. And so all I did was distribute multipli multiplication by r. <coughs> Okay, so any question about how that happened? <coughs> okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the following. SK minus RSK. That is to say, I'm going to take the previous two lines. I'm going to take the first line and subtract the second line from it. All right, so what cancellation will occur? Right, almost everything, right? <laughs> So, for example, these will cancel, these will cancel, right? And then, you know, something will have canceled with that one, and then this one. So, what terms are not canceled? Right, this term, that one remains, and this term, that one remains. All other terms cancel. <coughs> Okay, so then what you ob obtain is something that looks like this, a minus a r to the k plus 1. Okay, so that's a nice formula. Now, what's important to realize is that, you know, I made the restriction that a isn't 0 and that r is not 0, and what that means <coughs> is that I can solve for the quantity SK. So on the left hand side, I'll factor out the common term SK. SK is equal to 1 minus R. And that, <coughs> on the right hand side, that's equal to uh, A. And then I'll say, well, I'll just leave it like that. A minus A R to the K plus 1. OK, so then now, I can solve for SK by saying that SK is equal to A minus AR to the K plus 1 over uh, 1 minus R. So now I have a question for you. Someone tell me, what I've written here is almost legitimate, but not entirely legitimate. In what way could this line that I've just written not actually be legitimate? If R is 1, right? If r is 1, then such a thing is not possible. So, I'm going to write down here, this is assuming r is not 1, and I want some, one of you to tell me why it's perfectly reasonable to assume that r isn't 1. <coughs> Sorry? Is equal to rsk. Ah, right. So then SK would be, so we wouldn't be able to solve for anything. But I want a reason, so that that's a good reason. So, but I want a reason involving this. It would just be A, right? It would just be A, and then it certainly couldn't converge ever anyway. <coughs> okay. So this is the kth partial sum. Okay, and now I'm going to rewrite this just a little bit and say that SK 
is equal to a over 1 minus r and then minus <coughs> a r to the k plus 1 over, no, I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to write it like eh, minus a over 1 minus r multiplied by r to the k plus 1. Okay, now the partial sum sk, what is the varying symbol in sk? What is the variable? It's k, <laughs> right, it's k. a and r are both constants. They're both constants. So these terms right here, right, this term, that's a constant for sk, for the partial sum, and this term, since it's exactly the same as a constant, right, but this term in green, this is the term that's varying. So the question is, the question we want to ask, <coughs> is assuming that you know r isn't zero and also not one now under what circumstance under what circumstance does sk converge okay, so let's think of an example what what if i took r is half right r is one half this would not does not depend on k, this does not depend on k, this is the only term that depends on k. So what would happen if I took r as one half and I kept letting k get bigger and bigger and bigger? What would happen to this term? It would get smaller and smaller and smaller and converge to zero. So this term right here, this term would go to zero and then multiplied by this term, which is a constant, still goes to zero. So what would be left over? Just this one, which is what we expect, right? So now, uh, what's another example of an R that would that does the same thing? You know, R is one half did what I just claimed. What's another thing that would do it? Okay, anything between zero and one, but you can do better than that. What about negative one half? Right. What if you were plugging in negative one half here? then in absolute value, this term would be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but its SIGN would be alternating between positive and negative. Would that matter? No, it wouldn't matter. So how about another thing? What if, what if I was to plug in 2 into here? What would happen to this term boxed in green? Get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger forever and ever? Okay. So let's formalize that. So the limit as k goes to infinity of sk is equal to the limit as k goes to infinity of a over 1 minus r minus a over 1 minus r multiplied by r to the k plus 1. So as I said previously, the, the varying symbol is k, so then I'm going to say that this is a over 1 minus r minus a over 1 minus r multiplied by the limit as k goes to infinity of r to the k plus 1. <coughs> r to the k plus 1. <coughs> okay. And this this converges exactly <coughs> when the absolute value of r is less than 1. Be and I don't have to worry about it being 1 because we already made the assumption and the claim that it's not 1. <coughs> okay, and when it converges, so this is a 1, <laughs> right? not an absolute value sign. This converges exactly when r is less than 1. And since r to the k plus 1 goes to 0 as k goes to infinity when the absolute value of r is less than 1, the limit as k goes to infinity of sk is what? Finite, yeah, but you can tell me exactly what it is. 
it's a over 1 minus r. So I'll write it in two steps. a over 1 minus r minus a over 1 minus r multiplied by 0, which is a over 1 minus r, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so any questions about this? So I'd like to emphasize the structure of the way this went, right? I said, if a series can be written as so, as such, then it is a geometric series. And then I make a claim about what, about the conditions under which it converges. And then in this very special case, uh, even more, we're able to say, and not only can I tell you when it converges, but I can tell you what it converges to. And the way that was accomplished was by considering the sequence of partial sums and saying, ah, under this condition, the sequence of partial sums converges, and under all of these other conditions, it does not, blah, blah, blah. Does everybody get the general structure? Because we're going to do it so many times. <coughs> okay. So, let's do an example of a geometric series. So, how about the sum from n is 0 to infinity, and we'll do an easy one here to start out. <coughs> how about... Uh, 7 over 5 to the n. So my claim to you is that this is a geometric series. So if it is a geometric series, then you should be able to write it as such. So the sum from n is 0 to infinity. So first I'll say, I'll put the 7 here and say multiplied by 1 over 5 to the n. Okay. Then I'll say that this is the sum from n is 0 to infinity of 7 multiplied by... Now, I want to somehow say... Right, is this, this is not r to the n, this is 1 over something to the n. So how can I somehow rewrite this expression as something all to the n? Right, so I'm going to do it in two steps. I'm going to do it in two steps because it's just a slight algebraic step that I want you to see for the coming examples, right? So I said that 1 is actually 1 to the n, <coughs> right, and 5 to the n is 5 to the n. So then now I have this ratio of things to the n, 1 to the n over 5 to the n. So when you have such a ratio, how can you combine it? Right, all to the n, right, 1 over 5 to the n. So what I've used here is that a to the n over b to the n is a over b to the n. Okay, so then now, this is now indisputably a geometric series. So, since that's the case, you should be able to tell me that a is, what, 7, and r is 1 fifth. Okay, so then, 7 over 1 minus 1 fifth. So then that's what, 7 over 4 fifths. So that's 35 over 4. Fantastic. Any question about this example? <coughs> okay. So how about this one? The sum from n is 0 to infinity of how about um, 8 multiplied by 3 to the n over 2 to the n. And no one say anything. <coughs> Just solve the question. Okay, so if we proceed in the same fashion as
as the previous example, then this would be 8 multiplied by 3 halves to the n. So this is undoubtedly a geometric series. And if you wrote the next, this next line that I'm about to write, then you have entirely missed the point. 8 over 1 minus 3 halves. So if you wrote that, then you've entirely missed the point. Now let's continue this for just a minute. This would be 8 over negative 1 half, which would be uh, negative 16. Now let's think about that for just a minute. How about these terms in this series? What is the SIGN of every one of those terms? Positive. Does it make sense in any corner of the universe? to add up infinitely many positive numbers and obtain negative 16? No. no, it doesn't. Okay? So all of you that got negative 16, don't raise your hands, but just, just realize that, okay, there's something here that you missed. What is it that was missed? The absolute value of r is greater than 1. Under what conditions does the geometric series converge when the absolute value of r is less than 1? Okay, so then the correct response from here should have been to say that r equal to 3 halves and therefore the series diverges. Okay, and all of this is just a big, you'll get no credit or consideration on that, on that answer. <coughs> so any question about this one? Okay, so then now. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because p basically one of the major patterns for the rest of the semester is going to be I give you a series, you say, ah, I recognize it as this category of series, and then you're supposed to determine whether or not it converges. You know, part of the time I'm going to give you a series which converges, and you'll have to say, okay, it's this category of series, it has these characteristics, and therefore the for these reasons and because of this computation, it converges. Okay, but p part of the time, half of the time, I'm going to give you a series which doesn't converge. And I want you to tell me why it doesn't converge. Okay, and then if you just, if you just approach this, this rest of the semester algorithmically, just, oh, okay, in this place I'm supposed to use A over 1 minus R, like I did here, right, then your answers don't make any sense. Okay, and the graders will not be forgiving. Okay, so let's do another example. <coughs> So how about this one, the sum from n is 0 to infinity of 3 to the, t to the 2n plus 4 divided by, uh, how about 2 to the 5n minus 1, like so. So now you should be a little bit gun shy. Like the last one. Oh, wait a minute. He's playing around. He's playing games. Okay, this one kind of looks like 3 to the n over 2 to the n. So maybe it looks a little bit like 3 halves to the n. Would such a thing converge? No, such a thing would not converge. <coughs> but maybe I'm just playing around. So in order to analyze this one effectively... In order to analyze this one effectively, you need to algebraically manipulate all of these exponents. So the numerator can be written as 3 to the 2n multiplied by 3 to the 4. And then the denominator can be written as 2 to the 5n multiplied by 2 to the negative 1 by splitting the, the exponents in the usual way. So then now 3 to the 4, that's a constant, that's 81. And 2 to the negative 1, that's a constant, that's one half. So then I'll factor out that constant. So this is n is zero, and then I'll say that, that this is what? 81 divided by one half is 81 multiplied by two. So I'll, I'll do it in two steps, right? So 81 divided by one half, right? And then this now is going to be three to the two n divided by two to the five n, like so. 81 divided by 1 half is 162. So from n is 0 to infinity, 162. And then now I need to start rewriting this 3 to the 2n and 2 to the 5n business. So someone give me a recommendation for 3 to the 2n. Okay, so 
3 to the 2 to the n, right? Good. That's the one I was looking for. So 3 to the 2 to the n. In analogous fashion, the denominator can be written as 2 to the 5 to the n. So this is the sum from n is 0 to infinity of 162 multiplied by 9 to the n 9 to the n divided by 32 to the n and then now <coughs> that exponent can be factored out of the quotient so that's 162 multiplied by 9 30 seconds to the n so we have now played the game and we've made it written in sort of the canonical form of a geometric series <coughs> since it's that way you should be able to tell me that a is what 162 and R is 930 seconds. So that means that this should be equal to 162 divided by uh, 1 over divided by 1 minus 9 over 32, whatever that happens to be. I'm not actually very interested in you, you know, taking it any further than that. So any question about this example? So the purpose of this example is to show you that I can make it look a little bit confusing, right? I can even make it a little bit look a little bit misleading because at first glance you might think this looks like three halves to the n, but it's not. It's actually more like nine thirty seconds to the n. Okay. So any question about this one? <coughs> okay. So now I have another subtlety that I want to expose you to. So how about the sum? from n is 1 to infinity of how about 5 over 3 to the n. That's it. That's the rub of this whole question. Ah. For example, you could do something like that. So let's let's consider here. <coughs> right, I'll do this down here like so. Right, this will be the sum from n is one to infinity of 5 multiplied by 1 third to the n. Right. So I feel comfortable doing that in one step now that you've seen, seen it. Okay. Now, this is a geometric series in a sense, right? but it's not the, the indexed in the usual way. So where is a geometric series usually indexed? At 0. Right, so the effect of indexing it at 1 essentially means that we're not counting the first term. We're just adding up the second term on. So will this converge? Yeah, it'll still converge. It'll converge because it has ratio 1 third. Okay, so it converges. However, it does not converge to A over 1 minus R. It does not converge to A over 1 minus R because we left off the first term. Right, the first term is missing. Okay. <coughs> So what we need to do, what we need to do is you can, you know, I, I hear various students go about thinking in various ways like, okay, well, I'll do A over 1 minus R and then subtract the first term. That's a perfectly legitimate way to do it. Okay, so then I'm going to say, let's do it like this. This will be the sum from N is 0 to infinity because that's what I want it to be of 5 multiplied by 1 third. Okay, so then now, bef I haven't written any index, uh, indices in this one yet. Okay, so what this one is, <coughs> right, this term, this sequence up here, this should be 5 multiplied by 1 third plus 5 multiplied by 1 third squared plus 5, mul five multiplied by 1 third cubed plus dot, 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 dot. Right, that's what that's what this one is, and that's what this one must also be. 
So if that's the case, what index do I have to write right here? n plus 1. Right, it has to be n plus 1. <coughs> it has to be n plus 1 in order for these two things to be the same. Okay, so then this will be the sum from n is 0 to infinity of 5 over 3 multiplied by 1 over 3 to the n after factoring the exponents. And now this is a geometric series that is indexed at 0, which is the normal way. So then now you can just use the formula. This is uh, equal to uh, 5 thirds a over 1 minus 1 third. Okay, so any question about this? So the purpose of this example is to show you that sometimes games are being played with the index, okay? And this is especially true like on WebAssign. I can't even tell you how many times, okay, I have received emails about online homework systems saying, this online homework system doesn't even know what a geometric series is. It's A over 1 minus R, and then blah, 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 blah. And then I look at the question, and the index is starting at 1 or 2 or something like that. Sorry? Why does, it give us evil questions? Why does it give you evil questions? Well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so generally speaking, generally speaking, the general formula if the index for a geometric series is off is this. If you are summing from n is k to infinity for some k which is greater than or equal to zero, okay, so from n is k to infinity of a r to the k, with a not zero and the absolute value of r greater than zero and less than one. So that is to say that we have a legitimate convergent geometric series, but for some reason we've said that the index is going to be moved a little bit. Oh, so this should not be k, <laughs> right? That should be n. Okay, <coughs> then this, right, this means a r to the k plus a r to the k plus 1 plus a r to the k plus 2 plus all the way. So then what that's saying is we're starting with index k instead of index 0. So this can be rewritten as follows. We can say that, well, this is the sum and I'll re-index it to start at 0 of a r to the, now what exponent do I need? n plus k. Right, because if I use the exponent n plus k, then these two things agree. <coughs> so then now this can be factored in the way we were doing previously. This is the sum from n is 0 to infinity of a multiplied by r to the k multiplied by r to the n. And so now this term that I'm squaring, this is the, the new a, right, the constant a. It's constant with respect to n. So this is equal to a r to the k over 1 minus r. So this is a more general formula than the one that you knew, right? The one that you knew was uh, in the case when k is 0. In the case when k is 0, right, what would this formula be? a over 1 minus r. Right, this is the case when k is something other than 0. Okay, so any question about it? <coughs> Fantastic. So that's a geometric series. Okay. Now let's relax our restrictions about series for a minute and let's just consider series generally speaking so be but before I do that I'd like to ask again so that it's fresh in your mind what is a sequence it's a list of numbers a list of infinitely many numbers and what is a series it is an attempt to sum up all of those numbers it's an attempt right Series might converge, they might not. <coughs> okay. Yes? Is 
So, you could, y there are many cases in even physical sciences, but especially in mathematics, where you will sum over negative indices. Like, so for example, uh, there's a lot of very interesting, there's an interesting mathematical thing called a Laurent series, where you sum over all integers, right? Negative ones, zero, positive ones, all of them. But we're simply not going to cover that kind of thing in this class. But there are certainly contexts in mathematics and in physical sciences where it is interesting. But just, we're not going to talk about them. <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> I'm going to write down a few properties. of series. <coughs> okay, so then let let uh, the sum, and I'm going to ignore the index, right? So then my ignoring the index here is saying that wherever it happens to be indexed from, 0, 1, wherever. So let the series of A in be convergent to A, and the series of B in be convergent to B, and, it's, and the indices are compatible, right? So then they both start at 1, they both start at 12, they both start at wherever. Then there are several things. So first, the sum of the sum. <laughs> what do you suppose this converges to? A plus B. So I guess I could write some more difference, right? <coughs> Great. Okay. <coughs> Another one. The, o the only other one we're going to consider is how about the sum of C multiplied by A N where C is a constant? What will it be? C A. Okay, so the purpose of these is to show you that, you know, the sum sort of acts linearly in the way that you hope it does. <coughs> okay, and now here, <laughs> here's a big one. Right, this isn't actually a big one. This is a small deal, but students frequently mess it up. Okay, this is called the nth term test for divergence of a series. Okay. Now, I'd like to emphasize that this is called the nth term test for divergence. But I cannot even express to you the sadness and the number of times I've had a student quote for me Therefore, this series converges by the nth term test for divergence. Okay? The nth term test for divergence can tell you when a series diverges. It tells you nothing about when it converges. Okay. <coughs> the statement of, of the test is this. Really, it's... I'll break it into two pieces. So first if the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n converges so if it converges then the limit as n go as n goes to infinity of a n is 0 right, this is the positive version of the of the test. Okay, so if you go through the logical negation, the logical negation of this is the following. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is not zero, then what? the series must diverge.
So this is the thing. <coughs> so these two statements are logically equivalent. Right? They're logically equivalent in the following in the following sense for those of you that have taken or will take some kind of mathematical logic or philosophical logic class. Right? The negation of P implies Q is equivalent to not Q implies not P. Okay, so then if the series converges, then the limit is zero. If the limit isn't zero, then the series can't converge. Okay, now the you need to be careful with the direction of the implication, right? The direction of the implication is important. If the limit isn't zero, the series does not converge. What about if the limit is zero? Then you can make no conclusion whatsoever. None. No conclusion can be drawn. Okay, the only time a conclusion can be drawn is when the limit is zero, is non-zero. <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to prove the first thing, and the second thing is equivalent. So, proof. Assume that the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n is equal to L. Okay, so it converges and it converges to L. <coughs> then the sequence of partial sums S k must also converge to L. so that we have the following properties. <laughs> One, the limit as k goes to infinity of, this, of the partial sum as k is L. Right, the limit of the sequence of partial sums is L. <coughs> okay, and we also know that as k is equal to the previous partial sum plus what? plus a k. Right, so then, for example, s10 is equal to s9 plus a10. s42 is equal to s41 plus a42, etc. Because you're just adding one to the end every time. <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> we also know that the limit as k goes to infinity of s k minus 1 is what? It has to be L. <laughs> right, so all I'm doing is saying that, well, I'm just moving the index back by 1. Okay, but in the limit, after I let the index go to infinity, it still has gone to infinity, and the limit is still L. <coughs> okay, so then, I can say the following. So L is equal to the limit as K goes to infinity of SK, which is equal to the limit as K goes to infinity of SK minus 1 plus AK. <coughs> now, since this limit exists, since this one that I'm boxing in green has to exist, that means I can split this and say that this is equal to the limit as k goes to infinity of s k minus 1 plus the limit as k goes to infinity of a k. Alright, now this one, I know what this one converges to. What does this converge to? That one converges to L. So that's L plus the limit as k goes to infinity of a k 
So I have a nice equation here that says L is equal to L plus the limit as k goes to infinity of a k. So then I can subtract L from both sides of the equation and conclude that 0 is equal to the limit as k goes to infinity of a k, which is what I wanted to show. Okay, so then what I started with is I said, let's assume, let's assume that I have a convergent series. Then it must be true that the corresponding sequence converges to 0. There is no other possibility. Okay, then, because of just the rules of, of logic, the, the negation of this is that if the limit isn't zero, the series doesn't converge. Okay, so let's do an example of this. <coughs> okay, and I, you know, I can mix it up pretty good here. So how about the series from one to infinity of something great, like the secant of 1 over n. So what is an in this question? Right, what is the sequence? The secant of 1 over n. Okay, so let's compute the limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of an is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the secant of 1 over n. Now, that 1 over n term, what is that going to? 0. And is secant continuous at 0? Yes, secant is continuous at 0. So what that means is you can commute the order of limit and secant. Okay, this is possible. Possible because secant is continuous. Okay, so this is the secant of 0. And what's the secant of 0? 1, right? Because recall that secant is 1 over cosine, so this is 1 over cosine of 0. The cosine of 0 is 1, 1 over 1 is 1. So the limit of the sequence is 1, right? The limit converges to 1. Great. So what is the conclusion here? The series diverges. Right, the series diverges. So therefore, series diverges by the nth term test for divergence. Right, because 1 is not equal to 0. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, so now I want to give you another example to see what you're going to say. What can you say about this one? So can we say anything about this one at all? And so how about, is it a geometric series? Nope, not a geometric series. Um, how about the nth term test? Can you use the nth term test for divergence? 
What is the limit of the nth term? The limit of the nth term is zero, so what can you conclude? Nothing. You can conclude nothing. Okay. So, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is zero, which implies that the nth term test for divergence has no conclusion. Okay, so then we don't actually have the means to deal with with this series as yet. But some of you have seen a little bit of this stuff before, so I'll ask those of you. What is the name for this series? This particular one? Starts with H. Ends with harmonic. The harmonic series, right? This is the harmonic series. Har Monic series. Okay, so then I'm only going to, I'm just going to leave the harmonic series there and not tell you what actually happens to it. Uh, and I'll tell you that the nth term test just can't make a conclusion. Okay, so any question about it? Okay, so now let's do a sort of practical example. It's actually not a practical example, really, in my opinion entirely unrealistic. So then, <coughs> let's say that a ball is dropped. <laughs> from a height of three meters. And this is a bouncy ball. Okay, and it's a very, very good bouncy ball. So a ball is dropped from a height of three meters, and the ball rebounds. Nine tenths of the distance. Every time. Okay, so it, it's dropped from a height of three meters, it falls down, okay, it hits the floor, it bounces back up, and always, and always achieves a height of nine-tenths of the distance it fell down. Okay, find the total length of vertical, vertical travel. Okay, so for those of you that are wondering what kind of picture it is that I'm talking about, right, so there's some kind of ball. <coughs> okay, so then now, strictly speaking, it would be just, you, you know, according to the story, probably dropping straight down. But I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw it as if it's moving to the right a little bit because that just makes the picture easier to look at. Okay, so it falls down a height of three meters, so this is an initial three meters. Okay, and then it bounces back up nine-tenths of its height, its original height, and then goes back down, and then bounces up nine-tenths of that height, and down nine-tenths of that height, down, nine tenths of that height, and down. So you can sort of get the pattern. All right. So the question is, is how far does it travel up and down all of this way? <coughs> okay. So does everybody see the the question? What's being asked? Okay. So let's try and analyze the the question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit of arc. I'm going to add this, this much. So the reason for doing that is because it makes the problem a little bit easier, and I'll just remember to subtract that much at the end. So it traveled, if I consider the ball to have actually started here at the pink position instead of actually starting at the blue position, then it traveled up three meters and then down three meters. 
right? Up three, down three. So all together, how much was that? Six, right? So in this arc, it traveled six vertical meters. Up three, down three. Okay, so then how about this? How far did it travel? It traveled nine-tenths of three upward, and then nine-tenths of three downward. So altogether, it traveled nine-tenths of six. So it traveled, in this arc, six multiplied by nine-tenths. That's how far it traveled vertically in that arc. How about in the next arc? Right, six multiplied by nine-tenths squared. And then the next one, six multiplied by nine-tenths cubed, and then six multiplied by nine-tenths to the four. And then now I'm going to add this one little bit here, and I'm going to say that the first arc was actually six multiplied by nine-tenths to the zero, right? And then I'll put a one here. So then after that consideration, right, the, the total vertical travel is going to be the sum of all these, right? But this is a, you know, a fantastic bouncy ball, and it actually makes infinitely many such bounces. If only we had some way to add up infinitely many numbers. Oh, okay, so we can use a series. Okay, <coughs> so then this sum right here, this sum would be the sum from n is 0 to infinity of 6 multiplied by 9 tenths to the n. 6 multiplied by 9 tenths to the n. So this is a geometric series. Is it a convergent geometric series? Yes, it's convergent because the ratio r is what? L in absolute value less than 1. It's 9 tenths in particular. So then 6 over 1 minus 9 tenths. So this is 6 over uh, what? 1 tenth. So this is 60. So 60 meters. Is 60 meters the answer to the question? No. No, no because I need to subtract 3, remember? So I added that 3 at the beginning to make the question algebraically a little easier, so now I need to remove it again. So total vertical distance traveled is 60 minus 3, which is 57. So it traveled 57 meters. <coughs> vertically. So any question about this? Any question about this? You know, it raises interesting philosophical questions like, well, this ball had to go through infinitely many bounces in order to achieve that. Okay, so obviously this doesn't seem physically reasonable. Okay, but let's say it is physically reasonable for a second, <laughs> just for sake of argument. How long would it take such a ball to go through infinitely many such bounces. Would it take an infinite amount of time? And the answer is, well, you've got to think about it a little bit, right? How about, if does it take the same amount of time to fall from 10 meters as it does to fall from 1 meter? No? It's different. So the amount of time it takes to go up and down for each arc is less. So I could ask the question. I'm not going to, at least not today, not right here, I could say, what if I give you this silly bouncy ball problem? How long does it take this bouncy ball to bounce these infinitely many meters, or th these infinitely many arcs totaling 57 vertical meters? Is it a finite amount of time? You know, if I have such a ball, right, does it, does it bounce slow enough to where the amount of time is infinite, or does it start bouncing really fast? <laughs> and then it somehow achieves infinitely many bounces in a finite amount of time? Hmm. A little bit philosophical. Okay, so any questions about this? Okay, so now I'm going to just mention one thing and leave you to think about it over the weekend. No, 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 no. I, I can't tell you everything, right? Sometimes I have to leave it to you to think about it. I encourage you to think about it over the weekend. <coughs> okay. So then, so then, 
the thing I want to bring up to you is this. Is let's consider the following a sequence that looks like this. So I'm going to plot a sequence. Let's say that it, it has values like so. Um, yeah, like this. Okay, and it just sort of continues. You know, maybe this is something like a n is 1 over n to the p, something like that. Okay, we want to add all these up. Okay, so that is that is that I want to add up, in a sense, the length of all of these green segments. Right, and I want to know if that's a finite length. So, mm, contrary to my drawing and ability to draw, what is the distance between each one of these green segments? It's 1, right? Because these are all being evaluated at integer values, right? Integer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, blah, blah, blah. So now here's one thing that I'd like to point out that's a little bit strange, is that, well, if I consider this rectangle, right, if the length of this, if, if this green length is some value I'll call uh, H for height. What is the width of this rectangle? It's 1. So what about the height and the area of those rectangles, numerically? They're exactly the same. They're both H. They both have exactly the same value. Right? So the height of a rectangle that has width 1 is exactly the same as its area. So adding up the length of all of these green line segments, adding up the length of all those green line segments is exactly the same as adding up the area of all of these rectangles? Hmm, that's interesting. Have you ever heard of something that's like adding up the area of a bunch of rectangles? <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Starting to have bad flashbacks. <laughs> right. Okay, so then, so this is what we're going to do. What we're going to do is I want to, you know, a series is an infinite sum. It's I'm saying I want to sum up infinitely many numbers. And I'd like to remind you that an integral is an infinite summation of infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles. So an integral is also an infinite summation. So a series is an infinite summation of a list of an infinite list of numbers, and an integral is a summation of the areas of infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw an analogy between them. And basically what it's going to come down to is this, is I'll be able to say, you, you will be able to say, and I will show you how to say that, ah, this series right here behaves like this integral. And if this integral converges, then this series converges. So what's going to happen is that you'll be able to say, ah, for these reasons, these two, this integral and this series are comparable. They will have to both converge or both diverge. It cannot be possible that one of them converges and one of them diverges. Okay, and that is going to be called the integral test. And we will talk about it on Tuesday. <coughs> have a nice weekend. <coughs>